thrilled to be here recording your show. By the time you all will be watching it, it will be fr- uh, Saturday evening. But we are here on a Friday evening. I'm thrilled to be here joined by my dear, fr- dear brother, nobody better on Our Lady of Fatima that I know of, period, than my brother Kevin Simons. And, of course, Joseph and Monique Gonzalez. We're going to be talking about their new book, incredible book. And I am, of course, as Kevin knows very well, I'm going to have to brag. I got a look, an insight, behind-the-scenes look at the book before the book has even come out, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy, How God Prepared the Americas for Conversion Before the Lady Appeared, a new upcoming incredible book that they've authored. Kevin, my dear friend, helped them work on the book. I believe he did editing. Uh, With that being said, I do want to hand the reins over to Kevin to kind of facilitate the conversation any way that he wants. Every now and then, I'll interrupt and I'll say, hey, guys, educate me on this or educate me on that. Uh, Thrilled to be here with you all. With that being said, uh, I hope you all are doing well. How are you doing this evening, Kevin and Monique and uh, Joseph? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having us. Definitely. Excited to be here. Yeah, we've been looking at some of your videos and just really impressed with how deep you go into the theology and the philosophy behind things. So definitely up our alley. Looking forward to this. Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) Kevin brother, hope you're doing well, my friend. Great to be with you again. Yeah. Same here. Uh, I'm doing okay. It was just kind of a busy day today. And uh, if I may, I just want to ask your audience just to pray for my mother. She's uh, Mm -hmm. not doing too well. She got, you know, it's, yeah, uh, more cancer was discovered and, so just if everybody would mind please praying for, I would appreciate it. Amen. So okay. Sorry. What's her name? Uh, Margie. 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 Okay. We'll pray for. Her. Don't mean to get too personal or sad on a bad note at the end, at the outset of the of this no. interview. No, not at all. Just not prayers. At all. Yeah, prayer. yeah, that's a big yeah. deal. We've got to pray for each other. Prayer is beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so. Uh, I don't know. Do you, do you want me to just take it off? Do you want to do anything with it? Take him, it or? off, brother. No, you, yeah, you're, 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 you're Run the man. Yeah, you're the man, Kevin. You know it. You know it. You know the book. I think maybe just generally, just like just general introductions, and then um, mm-hmm. kind of then just like divide it up into like maybe like Joseph and you can talk a little bit about the book itself, and then okay. maybe then we kind of have more of a discussion between the three of us about how it came to be because I was involved with the editing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for more of the history, the who's who, the background yeah. stuff, and then more, and then kind of delve deeper more into the content. What's the big deal about this book? You know, what what does it uncover? And then, and then because of some uh, Q and A or something amongst you know with with, with the authors, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then kind of wrap it up. That's general format I'm thinking of. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Lay it on it. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, okay. I guess the first thing is, is like, uh, you guys just want to introduce yourselves first, just more formally. We get to know you a little bit more. Who are you? When people don't know sure. you, you well too much, maybe. I don't know. Right. Because uh, I, I've been a composer, it, it, mainly in Hollywood, for about 30 years. I worked on TV, film, and I also worked on concert music. So I wrote a lot of choral pieces, symphonic pieces. And actually, that's what got us into this book because mm-hmm. I was looking for. Aztec song poems or the text because so, I wanted to set it to music for a piece of music that I was writing way back in the 1990s. So um, that's, you know, uh, we only wrote this book out of holy obedience. Very um, much. Because I've had a 30 years career as a composer for me, you know, and I just turned 60 to, to write a book. You know, that was that was a pretty strange thing to do. But we really felt like we had to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I picked up this poem. I was shocked because it sounded so much like the Guadalupe narrative. Uh, mm-hmm. I it hurt my faith because uh, secular scholars were saying, well, obviously these earlier song poems are the source material for a fabricated Guadalupe story. It really threw me for a loop. And the only reason I'm bringing that up because it sets up uh, my introduction to many. So sure. why don't you tell us about yourself? And- what happened? So I'm from the Los Angeles area. I have a background in classical voice. I had been away from California for a while, came back and was hoping to work with a composer, was introduced to Joseph and um, he hired me pretty quickly after we met. And then um, within the first few months of knowing him, he was being asked by Carnegie Hall to do his full symphonic oratorio again at, at their location. And what happened was he wanted to add some more music so he hands me this big book, right, of song poems, indigenous song poems. And he says, can you help me find some material? So I go into the book and I start with the very first song. And 
what was really surprising to me was, it, like he said, it sounds like the Guadalupe story. You know, it's about someone who's looking for holy sweet flowers and he supposedly finds them on top of a hill and gathers them in his tilma and then wants to take it down to share with the lords and the princes. So what happened was as soon as I saw that, I, I called for Joseph and I said, hey, can you come in here? I'm kind of concerned about something. I showed him what I found and he said, oh, we'll go to the back of the book, flip to the back of the book and see what the um, translator said. And that's when I saw what he had discovered already, that they think it was a, everything uh, written after our, about our later Guadalupe was based on these song poems. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, we kind of said, you know, let's get to the bottom of this because our experience is a little different. It didn't harm my faith at the moment just because the strangeness of my own conversion. So we decided to put our heads together and research and it was 14 years of what we call our wonderful obsession and it kind of started that way. Right, we, we met in 2009, uh, we married in 2012. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we, uh, this book and this research has been a, a large part, of our, part of our relationship. Our relationship. So wow. that's a little bit of background. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. Um, and then uh, just a little bit about myself real quick is that I've been on uh, 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 William show before, but uh, my name is Kevin Simmons and I was, I live in North Dakota and I'm a specialist in the church's theology of private revelation. And, uh, most notably, I'm kind of more now, more or less now around YouTube as the Fatima guy. <laughs> uh, if you haven't kind of read on, the, on the, the third part of the secret of Fatima that kind of, you know, questions and or debunks a lot of the fourth secret conspiracy stuff. But my larger work is the church's theology of private revelation, which fits very much into what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. very excited to get into uh, this, uh, into the, into the, talking about the book with you guys. <clears throat> All right, so that's a little bit about myself. Um, I think, William, everybody probably already knows you. I think no introduction is necessary. <laughs> if they're here on my channel, I hope they do. I hope they do know who I am. But let, let me kind of, let me throw this at you all. Um, Joseph and Monique, uh, whoever would like to answer. For people that are tuning in, because I know I've got a lot of people from around the world that tune in. And in Europe, uh, they very, very well, they're, they're very well aware of Our Lady of Fatima. For my German friends, our Lady of Al Al Totin. But at times, depending on what part of the world you're from, sometimes my European friends I, at times are confounded. They wonder, okay, well, you know, we've heard of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but we really don't know, you know, much about it. Is it an apparition? You know, what happened there? Could you maybe lay it out? What is, what are we talking about when we talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe? Could you maybe lay that out and, you know, kind of like briefly for maybe my my audience because i know i will have a lot of europeans that may not know too much about our lady of guadalupe okay we'll just give you a, an overall uh you know uh, thumbnail basically uh you know the spanish came and and they, they came in uh cortez landed in central came to central america in 1519 by 1521 he had pretty much vanquished you know the aztecs people usually know the, the who the aztecs were Ten years later, in 1531, after kind of the rubble of plague mm -hmm. and war and all this decimation that had occurred, Our Lady of Guadalupe appears to a humble indigenous, indigenous man named Juan Diego. It's over four days between December 9th to December 12th. Uh, we could get into the story later. Oh, I'll oh, do you want me to do a quick yeah, summary? Yeah, why don't you give a quick summary of it? So the quick summary is that um, on December 9th, a humble indigenous man by the Christian name of Juan Diego was going to southwards to Mexico City to do the sacraments. Um, he encountered, and we'll go more deeply into this, but he encountered this flower world paradise within the first uh, few moments of, of these apparitions. And what occurred from that point is he encounters Mary and Mary asked for a chapel to be built on a, the site of Tepeyac. So she gives him the instructions to go to the local bishop, try to convince him to have that done. But of course he runs into obstacles and conflicts in regards to this because the bishop doesn't believe him even though he grills him quite a few times. And over the course of the next few days, there's a series of apparitions that occur where he's going back and trying to resolve these conflicts. But on the very last day, December 12th, what happens is even though he's supposed to meet with her to bring a, a sign for the bishop, he tries to avoid her. And he goes on the opposite side of this mountain range. It runs north and south. 
And in, in ev even though he's making the effort to avoid her, she still intersects him. And at that point, she instructs him to go to the top of the hill to gather in his tilma these beautiful flowers, whereupon he goes up there, he finds these flowers, and then carries them back down to the bishop as the sign. And when he arrives to the bishop, he lets fall the flowers from his tilma. And that's when the current image that we can now see Mexico City appears. And a tilma is a, a cloak, yeah, an outer like garment. An outer garment. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, <laughs> and then what occurs, so this image of Guadalupe appears, the mm -hmm. famous image, and between 1531 and 1541, it's estimated around 9 million mm -hmm. indigenous converted to the Catholic faith, which, by the way, that is the largest Christian conversion event in the history of the world mm -hmm. in the shortest amount of time, a 10 year span. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's kind of a thumbnail of who Guadalupe is. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot more to the story. Yes. Um, that I'm sure we're going to get into today, and especially the mm -hmm. Nahuatl. So, so just a, a little bit more. The 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 collective people of Mesoamerica at that time. Most of the people think they're Aztecs, but mm -hmm. there was many different groups uh, of different names that were very, very powerful. Not as powerful as the Aztecs, but uh, the Aztecs actually were called the Mexica. But collectively, the people, because they all spoke the Nahuatl language, they were known as the Nahua. So we're going to be using that term quite a bit. Okay, there we go. Okay. Does it help to answer your question? Oh, let me answer your question. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great, great. Yeah, and uh, I noticed that when, uh, Monique, when you were talking, you mentioned you had specified that Juan Diego was the Christian name yes. For, yes. for the person in question. And so for those that might not be aware, there's a much deeper history and they kind of just touched upon that and talk about the mm -hmm. Nahuatl, Nahuatl and stuff like that. So there's a mm -hmm. certain depth there. This is all like surface level mm -hmm. stuff, but there's so mm -hmm. much to mm -hmm. uh, yes. I want to point that out because I, a lot of people might be like, well, why would she say that? So, because there's a lot deeper stuff in there. Yes. Uh, much and, deeper. Like, significance and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, it's just, I mean, oh my goodness, there's just so much that we get. Yeah. Into. Yeah. Uh, so like, I mean, uh, oh, what's that? Oh no, please continue. No, I was going to say, so like one of them, uh, you guys mentioned the term song poems. Mm. Now, most everybody in North America, at least north of the North Hemisphere, is uh, uh, you know the Northern Hemisphere, you know above the equator, uh, not too familiar with this. It's a lot of anglicized culture. And okay. what exactly are song poems? Okay, so the history behind it is that after the fall of Mexico in 1521. Franciscan, primarily Franciscan missionaries came first. Uh, a big, a large group of 12 of them came in 1524. And Bishop Zumarga, the, the bishop of the account of the story, the one that Juan Diego showed the tilma to, he came in 1528. So there was a lot of activity that was going on. But initially what the Franciscan friars realized is they had to learn the language. But as you know, if you learn a language, it's not just enough to know the language. You need to know the culture. Yes. And the language Nahuatl itself is very metaphorical. It it uh, there's things that are referenced that you, that you, if you don't know what they're referring to, you you won't know what they're talking about. I mean, it's a very very difficult language. And of what happened is that they found that so much of their mythology, their folklore, their their concepts about life were expressed in these poems. That that was actually the way that they expressed their philosophy. And it was all sung. And it, yeah, it was sung and they were actually performed. So the thing is, is that these flower, these song poems that we're referring to, they were so embedded in the culture of the Nawa that the Franciscans felt we have to collect these poems. Mm -hmm. So they did. There was actually four, the, the 180 known song poems that were collected spread across four different historical documents. The one that is the most prominent is one called the Cantares Mexicanos. 90 of them are in this one document. There's another one called the Romances of the the, the Lords of New Spain. There's like 20 in there. And then, so they're, they're, they're spread across. They're spread, these. Out, yeah. they're spread across. So 
not all of these 90 songs are considered flower song poems. Some are historical accounts. Mm -hmm. Some are talking about the exploits of a king or something like that. But there's a sub genre underneath these, these song poems that are called flower song poems. Mm -hmm. Now these flower song poems are very philosophical in nature since it is, and, and something I know that we had spent a lot of time talking about when we mm -hmm. were putting the book together was that probably the best way to explain it to a Western audience is probably through platonic realism. Mm -hmm. That the, the whole idea of a transcendental beauty that exists in another place could be experienced through earthly beauty. Mm -hmm. So the earthly, earthly beauty is symbolized as a flower, as a specifically a four petaled flower. And there's a lot of symbolism with that. It has to do with the four regions of the universe, north, south, east, and west, and then the, the known universe. But the flower songs, the, the flower and the flower songs, these terms are used interchangeably, come from a place called the flower world paradise. So if you think about it in platonic terms, we get, we get a sense of the forms, the perfect forms on earth, but the perfection exists in another dimension. That's, a, that's just a very crude <laughs> Uh, explanation of this, but it, 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 it's kind of fundamental to these flower song poems and what they mean. So, okay, all right. So, so then just to kind of make some connections to the help for the audience to help them understand. So, you, um, so song poems with some differences or variants are would you say that they're kind of similar to like the bards of old, like a lot of people would be familiar with like medieval history, like the bards singing songs, mm -hmm. telling yes. great deeds and. Mm -hmm. arriving at some moral or or some other kind of lesson is some, some, something similar going on there oh yeah yeah you, you, you nailed it right on the head there yeah, there's so many there's so many similarities to the iliad and the odyssey mm -hmm. number one because they're it's written in verse and a lot of people have speculated that more than likely it was written in verse because it could have been memorized more than likely uh -huh. A lot of those had been in oral history before they were ever written down. Yeah, there's a lot written about that. Right, and it, it follows a, a similar trajectory. Also, in in Europe, um, you know, people think about like the troubadours and the trouvères mm -hmm. that would actually give the news. They would go from village to village, mm -hmm. uh, telling what was going on, and they, it was memorized through verse. That was that. There was a similar function that happened in Mesoamerica. Um, Sometimes traveling hundreds, thousands of miles along the these trade route, these trade routes more often than not, and it stretched north to south, like into the top of uh, South America, and, and even further down and into the northern part of North America. So, um, yeah, a lot of information was passed along, and the traditions and the religious beliefs were shared in a similar way through right. these song poems, through these I, corridors. I, mm -hmm. I think it's important to point just to kind of pin real, real quick on that point about the, how far traveled it is, because I think that that's mm -hmm. going to come back to, 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 to play a major yes. role in later discussions. Yes. Um, and I would be remiss if, uh, as a little bit of a nerd myself here, I can, uh, I think there's some parallels even to like with like contemporary fantasy, because like Tolkien, for instance, he was a mm -hmm. philologist and yeah. he created the languages of, of, of Middle Earth, uh, but there was a whole culture behind it. And if you don't understand the culture, you won't understand the language. Uh, Correct. Because it, it's so rich, especially with the Elvish, you know, like, um, like, you know, that's what Arwen says in the movies when she, wow. when, 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 when she I love you it. You are, I love you it. are a nerd. <laughs> so awesome we love, we love that you can do that. <laughs> I, I, I went to Franciscan University and there's a whole group of people that were really into this. And I was just like, this is so cool. You know, but uh, the, the, the words that certain words are embedded into everything and how it all comes together. And, um, you know, it, it's it's just like even in the movies, when you watch mm -hmm. the movies, you can hear. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, there's Neo Kuzdul, there's Adunaic, uh, and then there's uh, mm -hmm. there's Elvish for sure. And, but if you if you understand like like the parts of what they're singing when the elves are going to the Grey Havens and like Frodo and Sam come up upon them, you know, right. and they can hear they're singing in Elvish. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's Sindara, not Quenya. Um, and when and when they're, they're singing about um, like uh, uh, like Elbereth Girthoniel, 
I think is what how it goes. If you don't know what Elbereth is, you don't know what that all is. You just go right missing. Well, you, know? you know, if I could follow up on that point, see, we're, we're kind of like a spoiler alert right now. Mm -hmm. Because if we if we go to the account of Guadalupe, the one that everybody knows, Juan Diego and the Tilma, the flowers, you know, gathering them in the flowers, uh, gathering them as Tilma, the flowers mm -hmm. as Tilma, it's exactly what you're saying. If you don't know this backstory of the flower song poems, yes. and if you don't go back to the Olmec period and fall, if you don't trace these, you're not going to be able to un really understand the Guadalupe narrative. And mm -hmm. that's that's the main point. That's the crux we're, of this. We're trying to say, like what you're saying about Alvish and, and Lord of the Rings and everything, mm -hmm. is that imagine if you were just reading a surface level plot line of Lord of the Rings without any background. Oh God! That's what we feel yeah. it has been going on. I we're, and we're humbly saying that we're, we don't want to be, yeah. you know, boasting or anything like that. But w when we made this discovery and we yes. said, "Whoa, look at these! This puzzle fits together." And uh, let's explore it further and let's find a, out how far it goes. And let's hope somebody can. We're also hoping that with this book, that other people will pick it up and run with the different segments because it involves so many different fields of study. I mean, the, there's the language, and then yeah. there's the different the civilizations that were born, you know, along this timeline continuum, as well as all yeah. the philosophy. It'd be great to just get other people Maybe going other and people inspire, about inspire it. them to, to, yeah. to run with it. Yeah, one of our goals. It, it's, it's very detailed because it's, it's, there's a lot of cross-disciplinary a cross discipline that goes on yes. and yes you know and like and even like you, you cited plato you know that that's that's history mm -hmm. right there with the history of the forms you know and mm -hmm. there's a quick basic explanation of that would be that like you know like if we think of like dog well, what is dog we can identify it versus a, a cat you know there yes. has to be some, some kind of a, mm -hmm. a ethereal form from which everything else emanates you know Absolutely. Let me briefly, really briefly interrupt. Is the book available yet? Is it out already? Do you own yes. yes. It just came out okay. last Tuesday, November 21st. You can get it on Sophia now, as well as Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can catch them pretty much everywhere right now. I, I wanted to show people, and I'm going to hand it right back to you, Kevin. I, I wanted to show people the incredible cover, beautiful cover, but <laughs> the beautiful cover yeah. and incredible material in the book as well. I'm glad that you're telling me it's already available. I want people mm -hmm. to check it out. They've got the link right there. And when the show does air, the it will be hyperlinked as well. So now that I know it is officially out, go ahead and get mm -hmm. a copy. And mm -hmm. I would say, uh, what better time than to get a copy for your relatives? Mm -hmm. Perfect stocking mm -hmm. stuffers, perfect mm -hmm. gifts. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm glad to know it is available. Yeah. Kevin, yeah. Kevin, I'm sorry for interrupting you, brother. No, it's, like, I, no, it's actually good because the feasts are coming up. Guadalupe and um, and Juan Diego. So in a couple weeks. Yeah. Well, this is the book that days. people should get. I wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been, I've been talking up and down the coasts in this country, up and down about this book. Saying you can't even talk my pastor. It's coming out on twenty first, Father. You got to get this book. Yes, uh, yes. Because he's always interested in things with like Guadalupe and new information. I'm like you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd be a crying mm -hmm. shame, Father, if you don't get this book. Um, yeah, and here's hard copies right there, so you can see they're they're easily available. You can go and grab it, and it's wonderful. To finally see it come alive after yeah. 14 years we, it took, we didn't we weren't sure if it would actually happen so it's nice to finally yeah. see it yes. come to fruition so yeah yeah and i know it i know um uh lucia did such a good job uh, incredible with yeah. i remember when she was doing things i was like oh she's uh yeah more yeah. on that a little bit later though Sure. Uh, well, just, really get the book please audience get the book this is we're going to talk we're going to give you more reasons why you should get the book okay well, just really quickly, since we're just pointing at the book, I just wanted to uh, let the your audience know that the design of this is actually inspired by the actual codices that wow. the ancient Mesoamerican people created. So a lot of that scroll work, she was she was pulling those ideas straight from the codices and created this. And well, specifically from a monastery in Malinalco, um, Mexico, which actually uh, many uh, art historians say this is a clear indication that early mm -hmm. indigenous people, because indigenous painted the inside of this monastery, mm -hmm. that, they, that they were thinking of flower world concepts. And I know we haven't defined flower world concepts yet. And we will in a moment. And we will. But uh, by the time you get to the end of the book, we, we say if mm -hmm. flower world was is, is true, and if our hypothesis is true, then there should be evidence of it. And actually this monastery, Malinalco, is one of the strongest evidence that flower world was on the mind 
of the indigenous when they converted, not they, in a syncretic mm -hmm. way or paganism or anything no. like that. It was purely it was purely Christian concept by that time. But anyway, we thought it was appropriate to, for our illustrator to put that on the cover of the book. So a little bit of insight there. Incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So it, it, that's one of the other things I love is how the book just itself just emanates from Mesoamerican culture. Right. Looking at the you know, looking at the uh, you know the cover of the book and seeing those perfect uh, illustrations from 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 from, from Lucia. And uh, forget I still say the Portuguese Lucia. I see Lucia. I, I can't say Lucia anymore. <laughs> So, um, but uh, it's just, uh, it's just seeing all those, it just really draws you in. Like when you look at the interior of the book, like all those designs, mm -hmm. oh, it just sucks you right in. And pictures are worth a thousand words. And because yeah. a lot of people aren't familiar with Mesoamerican culture, I think these pictures directly, but also very subtly introduce you to what, what this book is about and with the culture that everything emanates from. You know, uh, can I add to that? Because I, I, this hasn't been yeah. brought up in any of our other interviews, but I've, I've been wanting to address it. What we sure. see, our book is primarily, you know, as you can see, we have an extensive bibliography. We have mm -hmm. several hundred footnotes. It almost, unfortunately, reads like a textbook at times because we wanted to prove our point and we, we didn't want people to think that we were just making, making up, it up. Making it up. So uh, many times the illustrations are reflections of actual mm -hmm. illustrations that archaeologists have made that we found in PhD dissertations, that we found in actual published, codices, pa published papers, yeah. published papers, things like that. But and many so many times our illustrator had to recreate those um, mm -hmm. and we put them, you know, just mm -hmm. to section them out or to highlight them. And we were, we were being honest. We were, we were but at, but at the same time. We, we knew that the book was going from myth to reality. There was this really yes. kind of strange uh, thing, even though we were point, we were very much in reality by, by making our point. But the, the story itself, the earlier poem, is in the realm of myth. So we kind of started blurring the lines, uh, not it, not lying or anything like that, but showing, trying to show through the illustrations that the book itself can actually illustrate this importance of, of metaphor and symbol. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, what the life, the illustrations took on because mm -hmm. our illustrator, Lucia, she did illustrate yes. the poem and she illustrated the Nikon Mopoa, the account of Guadalupe in the older style. But we make that very clear. We say, if there's not a caption on it, this is the artist's interpretation of this. We Because we didn't want people to think that these were actual from a codice or something like that. So we, we clearly demarcated that. But uh, anyway, but I, I we tried to actually to make the book be like a work of art too. And well, we're artists, mm -hmm. that's the way we think. So anyway. And, and it's yeah. a fundamental reflection of the culture at large because the Mesoamerican people, I, what I feel makes them a bit more unique is that all of their culture and beliefs was transmitted through artistic forms, whether it be song or dance or mural painting or you know designs of cities, it's all artistically represented. Mm -hmm. And that's a fundamental part and, of the book. And we try to reflect that in the book. In too. the book too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's 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 important because we're dealing with such uh, deep concepts, for, you know, philosophically and historically, and there's all these disciplines that can go into it. And for an audience that isn't as familiar with Mesoamerican culture, uh, all of these tools that you provide, I think, are just excellent to bring people into that world. Even if people only walk away with like a surface understanding of things, because there's so much of a depth and a richness. Uh, they still have that introduction, and they, there's plenty in the book. And then there's also other places through your footnotes and the, you know, the the, um, the bibliography at the end. People can go look and search on their own if they want to. So in a yes. way, there's something for everybody at, mm -hmm. at whatever level that they're at. You know, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I think is really awesome about this. Um, Kevin, I hope I hope that I'm not um, weird when I say that I fall in love with books that have. A ton of footnotes, and are really that to me, Kevin, <laughs> shows me that they people that you all have done your research, and I, I, I love that. I love that. You, you, yeah, you, you really it, did. It, 
if anything, it shows you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. true. Oh, yeah. that I, is like true. I, I like a footnote because it can I can look something up, but but the big yeah. debate is we have it at the bottom of the page or at the end of the chapter, or at the end of the book. Mm. That tends to be the major mm. issue. Right. Uh, just to real quick, quick, and I remember once I was taking a class with Dr. Scott Hahn, and he was telling us about how his publisher he doesn't have very many footnotes in his books because his publisher has told him don't do that because it's going to burden the book and nobody wants to read it. And I'm like, yes, but Dr. Han, you've loaded so much from so many people in this. Yeah. Like you, <laughs> you know, I would really just be careful about that, buddy. But yeah, but you know, I got to say that, you know, working with Sophia was really fantastic. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any problems with our suggestions. Um, even though yeah. we know that it, it, it caused them a lot more work. Uh, when we were talking about the footnotes, uh, we did say, well, we're going to, there were some that we, we will we'll take a few out that were repetitive or something that already mm -hmm. made the point. Um, but even the layout, you know, because uh, even it's like, tricky layout. yeah, it was a tricky layout where things had to be on top of one another and done in layers. And it, you know, the one who was laying it out uh, had some, we know that we caused her a lot of work. But uh, but they totally worked with us. So Sophia and Charles mm -hmm. McKinney and all of them were just really great mm -hmm. to work with. Nice. Yeah, I've been learning Adobe yep. InDesign for the past year and a half, and so it, uh, yeah, it can get hair raising if you're not careful. <laughs> it's like very tricky and tedious and meticulous, and it, like, if one thing will set the whole thing off. Not not as much as it does in Word, I think, but yeah, yeah it, it can be yeah. But yeah. it's got to get done because people need to, you need to show your homework as it were, show oh, your yeah. work, show, to show your math. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People can yeah. look things up, especially when you guys are doing this groundbreaking work. Um, well, so thank, I think you. thank you. That is the word, thank groundbreaking. You. Oh, yeah. It's it's very groundbreaking. And like, I think that's the word that we could use to kind of segue into this. So let me ask, like, the question is, why is why do we sing, why, we sing all these phrases, but why is it groundbreaking? Hmm. From where I sit, I think it's groundbreaking because uh, in the church, the, let me give the theologic principle. In the church's theology of private revelation, there's a dearly held uh, uh, principle that and it, uh, a lot of people would know it more in terms of what Aquinas says, grace builds upon nature. Yes. And in, in, in how it specifically works in theology of private revelation is God often works through the natural in order to communicate his grace or the supernatural, his supernatural life to people. Now, granted, we, that happens to the, you know, the sacraments too. I'm not saying that they're not exclusive, but God works through the natural oftentimes in order to effect supernatural, you know, to, to make that, to make the, make the supernatural known. So even at Fatima, God used the natural phenomenon of the sun in a very extraordinary way, you know, with the sun dancing. Um, and so, I mean, that's one one simple basic example. But now, we hear a lot about like Guadalupe. We mentioned you mentioned earlier, Joseph, about the nine to ten million people that converted. This has been I myself am a convert of twenty six and a half years, and I've heard about this stuff all the time. And everybody hears about the tilma, you know, Saint, mm -hmm. Saint Juan Diego's cloak with this image that just appeared, and nobody can explain it. How is the tilma not, you know? Uh, disintegrated in 500 years, you know. Um, well, and, and then the studies on the eye. So there's a lot of focus on the tilma. But you guys start taking this into a different direction. And can you tell mm -hmm. us, first yeah. of all, what that direction is, mm -hmm. and why you seem to take it differently from the, from the, fo you take some of the focus off of the tilma. So can you ex just uh, look at those two areas, open up with that. Mm -hmm. Well, just to speak very briefly, we, we don't really concentrate on the Tilma at all. There's very little in our book that's about the Tilma until the very, very end of the book. And the reason why that is, is because we treat the Tilma or we understand the Tilma as being just the tip of an iceberg that mm -hmm. has a good 3,000 years underneath it, and as well as a lot of symbolism and narratives and artistic forms that are underlying it, including the Nahua philosophy and the Nahua culture. So maybe Joseph want to tag team off of that and run with it. Yeah, before, yeah, the, the tip of the iceberg is is a really good symbol or metaphor mm -hmm. to, to look at this because everybody knows about the Tilma, they know about the Juan Diego story, they know about the millions of conversions. Mm -hmm. um, but before I go beneath the surface- just And what's to, supporting it, right? Uh, yeah, just quickly, you know, there's so many 
I guess, historical anomalies. Like, for example, here's here's a, here's one. How could a culture that was so sophisticated as the Aztecs seem to be converted by what many people see as a very simple story? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it seems um, it's it seems hard to believe that. A, a sophisticated people that had this society that was very hierarchical that that had you know customs and rituals and complex structures complex structures and an education system and everything could 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 be converted in this way it it feels as if there might that it might have been something that the spanish tricked them into or things like that i'm i'm just saying this is a lot of kind of the feedback that we've gotten from people when we've had these conversations so what the reason why, just to answer your question, why we feel it's groundbreaking is because our explanation takes into account the depth of the culture, the sophistication of the culture. It actually matches right in and actually shows how the sophistication of certain concepts, albeit peg, in a pagan way, mm-hmm. were actually be able to form bridges to, to Christian conversion. So now t- to get to the iceberg idea, is essentially the two main areas of study that we concentrate on is a concept called flower world Mm -hmm. and another concept called Nawa philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quickly on flower world. Flower world is the next. Do you want me to? Go ahead. Just just, just real quick. So would you, once you say thus far, would you say a good summary would be that uh, with respect to the question of not focusing so much on the tilma as much as these other areas is because Mm -hmm. There's so much to get to before you even touch the topic of the topic. Yes. That, yes. Okay, there you go. So that's a very <laughs> simple way to look at it, but you, that that's accurate yes. to say? Okay. Yes. And, and, and so your book is like, okay, folks, we got all this stuff, and it's so good, and it's so rich that by the time you look at the Tilma, it's just going to see that the Tilma is one piece of this much larger puzzle, the picture. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, – well, and if, so that, if you, you're saying that there's these two aspects, you're saying uh, Nawa philosophy and what was the other one? Flower, flower world. world. So they kind of act as a foundation. So when the Guadalupe narrative comes along, you can now understand why the indigenous reacted so intensely. Do you want to go into it? Sure. Okay. Yep, I, yep, this now we're, 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 we we are, we're, we're flower jumping world. into it now. This is this is it. There's a jump in. Okay, so really quickly, flower world is this is a religious belief system uh, based on a solar uh, floral paradisal realm filled with light and music, incandescence, iridescence, everything that could be visually and auditorily. And in fact, it, it encompasses all the senses. It's a place of pure beauty. And basically the people of Mesoamerica believed that this pl- this region exists, hopefully after they died. However, they had a very sophisticated system that showed that as a general rule, most people could not go there and that they needed to be worthy of this floral paradisal realm. Mm-hmm. So the way it ties into the Guadalupe narrative is that Juan Diego identifies as floral paradise directly himself by name. by name in the very beginning of the Guadalupe narrative that's written in the original Nahuatl language. Well, not just written, it was actually orally in the culture before it was written down. So right at the beginning of the Guadalupe narrative, when Juan Diego's coming down the hill, um, sorry, coming down from the north towards Mexico City, he's walking by the hill of Tepeyac and he's swept into a paradisal realm filled with light, music, everything's singing, everything's shining, it's radiating. And the moment this happens, he says, could I be worthy of what I hear? Which is very key. It ties into this old, this ancient indigenous need for worthiness of doesn't this place. It, doesn't he also say, is this not the place my ancestors spoke of? That's the second, yes. that's the second thing he says. So right after he says, am I worthy of what I hear? He then says, could I be in the place my ancient ancestors spoke of, the wow. flower world paradise, in Shoshitlalpan and Tonakatlalpan in the land of heaven. So in his very first two sentences, he uses the exact term that the Nawa people use for this region, this regional place. That's found all through the flower song Songs. poems, and that anthropologists have have said this is the term for the flower world oh, paradise, paradise of the Olmecs, of the Maya, all this mm-hmm. backstory that goes back to mm-hmm. 1500 BC. See. 
that's what Juan Diego is referring to right off the bat of the story. Right. And so just to give people a little more context of this, fl this floral paradise, what the reason why we know about this, flor this floral paradise today is in the last 30 years or so, um, anthropologists and archaeologists, linguists, as well as other um, interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary um, fields of study came together and discovered this uh, this floral world paradise through song poems that are littering the Americas all the way up to Wyoming throughout Mesoamerica and to the the uh, Guatemala in Nicaragua so that they found all of these song poems that whether it be from the Hohokam or the Hopi or the Paiute or the Nahua or other indigenous peoples, they all share a belief in this system. So it's geographically covering like thousands of miles, literally. So once they discovered that through the song poems, it was then that the archeologists stepped in and started hard dating, hard dating archeological ruins that were sh showing the reflections of m multiple characteristics that are shared within this belief system. And so that's kind of how they, that you can go on if you want, but that's basically how they found out about it. So when Juan Diego is using that exact terminology, he's tying to something that's just massive. And ancient. And ancient, ancient, ancient. And so deep. Very deep. And, it, and along with that is an actual story, as we mentioned before, that sounds just like the Guadalupe story. Wow. So you say the actual story. So, um, what do, and you mentioned does that tie in? Well, first, well, I'll take this in bits and pieces. Does that tie in with the song poems that we spoke about earlier? Yeah, it does. Okay, but before so, I go into that, well, well, I, well so like, like I said, we got to take this a little bit and probably in bites, but uh, so it ties into the song poems. Uh, you mentioned that there were close to I think 200 of them before, but is there any singular song poem? that sticks out in connection in this history? Yes, glad you brought that up. So, there, so there's a genre of flower song poems, okay? But there is one song in particular that really encapsulates all the other flower song poems. It's called, in English, the origin of the songs. In Nahuatl, it's Cuica Per Gallo. So this song essentially is really so many of the concepts that we see in ancient times, like we already talked about this flower world paradise, we haven't gone too much in the symbolism of the flower. I, I mentioned yeah. it briefly, but, but I think I said the flower is the connection between heaven and earth. It also is another, it's also a metaphor, a symbol for truth, that the only truth on earth can be experienced through the four petal flower on earth. But those four petal flowers are actually brought down by the singers mm -hmm. and are sung. So more correctly, it's it's the the, the way in which they express their Nawa philosophy was called uh, uh, in fla excuse me in, 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 um, <laughs> in flower in flower and song in flower the flower the song. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting the terms mixed up. So the flower the song is the it, it, it it's the way in which the singer could sing down the flowers and experience this kind heaven. of heaven on earth, but also reciprocate the, the beauty that was given to him and send it back to the sky by singing it in honor of God. So there was this reciprocal um, aspect to it. That's flower and song. And they actually said the gathering of these flowers is the only truth on earth. And it's, and it's, for you to gather those flowers in your tilma and show them to the lords and princes. So getting back to that primary song, the origin of the songs, let's see if Monique will just give a brief overview of the, uh, the narrative. So this ancient song poem, which we could believe it goes back a few thousand years, um, basically it's about a singer, and, and he actually starts off with a word, um, and I know Kevin really enjoys it. You know, you know, you know, no, no, no. Yeah, I ponder within my I heart. I ponder within my heart. Talking, we're still talking about the Quico Pacayo, right? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay, so this very first word from the start of it, we're seeing somebody entering into a state of contemplation of divine things. And right within the first few words, his utterance is, where can I find some good, sweet, precious flowers? And the structure of the, of the song the from that point, the, the flowers from the sky, is as he's looking for these 
precious flowers, these shining, radiating flowers, he's asking everything in his environment, where can I find them? Where can I find them? And a hummingbird steps forward to introduce him to this flower world paradise, this in Shoshit Lalpan and Tonakat Lalpan. And what happens is the hummingbird seemingly pulls him into this place. He seems to gather them in his toma. He seems to carry them down to lords and princes. And there's a lot of rejoicing in that because it makes his heart happy. But, but part of the sadness of the song, and we'll, I'll explain it in a quick second, is that it turns out he didn't actually get to go there. And he's pondering this within the song poem. I couldn't quite get there. I thought I saw them. I thought I gathered them, but I didn't. And then he explains why. He says, because I'm afflicted and I'm worthless and I sin on earth. That's why I can't gather the flowers in my tilma. And, but thankfully in the next few sentences, he's also explaining how he can get them. And he specifically states only the God of far and near can make one worthy of this flower world paradise. So the song ends this way. It's, it's a bit of a lament, but there's also a little bit of hope that someday somebody can be made worthy by in the Nawake. So the they can, the God of far and near so that they can gather these precious, sweet, aromatic flowers in their tilma. And, and be happy not only for themselves, but for others as well. And it kind of represents every man. It's not just one singer. It's the singer is every Mesoamerican man or every indigenous person within a, this large geographical range. So again, just briefly, the, the, the song poem is essentially a, a paradise lost mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. which is, which is a, a very common trope that happens throughout pagan mythology. Mm -hmm. It's a way in which to be able to explain the broken world in which we live in. We live in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and remember that name in Tloka Nawake, the god of Farnir who makes you worthy because it's going to play very prominently in the Guadalupe story. Yeah. So that, oh, you just offered the perfect segue. So this has been the Quica Pacayo and this, yes. this particular song poem about the singer who goes to the flower world paradise and he sees all this beauty and the birds and the hummingbird, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And he says to himself, the Nino, Nino Yononotsa, that I ponder within my heart, and he sees all these things. And and then, like, he all of a sudden, he finds himself back on Earth, and he's mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, was I really there? Did something happen? You know? Um, now, this, and this is a poem you said that had been around for thousands of years, a few couple thousand years, maybe a few thousand years, right? We we make that case because there's okay. there's specific things within the poem which mm -hmm. refer to very, very ancient, ancient concepts. Ancient concepts. It, it might get a little too technical to, to get into here. We explain mm -hmm. it in the book, but yeah. we make that case. But other, uh, other scholars, scholars have made have the case, made the case well that it's very its ancient. ancientness. Yes. Okay. So, so it's at the very least, it was very well known. Uh, it was ancient, very, very, very old by the time of the 16th century, right? Give or take. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because so, so then yeah. now, so then what happens? Sorry, I got we gotta we got, but like so now yeah. we have this this narrative that was very in the, through the song poem that was very well known throughout Mesoamerica. Yes. And now we have 1492, Christopher Columbus comes, every, you know, mm -hmm. Pinterest, Korea, you know, all the Spanish are coming and uh to Mesoamerica and they're encountering this culture. And by the time of 1531, we already have the Franciscans there, we have a bishop, mm -hmm. Zumarga, I believe you said was that, the, that was the proper pronunciation. Zumarga, yes. yes. Zumarga, and they're they're trying to spread the gospel, but they're coming to this culture. And mm -hmm. could yeah. you just was it just just uh, let's kind of start here because I do want to get a little bit more into the manuscript tradition of the Guadalupe mm -hmm. story because that's actually very important mm -hmm. for some other stuff that we that we need to get into. But uh, sure. just briefly. Uh, what was going on with the Franciscans and, and the bishop and how, how were their evangelization efforts going? Well, basically it wasn't going well. And we know this because even as uh, within the proximity of 1531, around 1530, Bishop Zumarraga writes a letter to the emperor in Spain and basically is telling him, we are failing. <laughs> this isn't working. People aren't converting the way we had hoped that they would and we should might as well just pack up and go home. Because even though a bunch of the Franciscans, uh, there was actually 12 of them that got there in 1524, 
Um, and they had many discussions and we do capture one of the main discussions in the book, in fact, in chapter six, we go and kind of like the details of that. But essentially what happened was because of the sophistication, it really was a sophisticated culture and a belief system with many layers of it. And we, we get into that in the book as well. The Nawa response in that first initial 1524 get together was, this is really beautiful and all, but thanks, but no thanks. And they pretty much say it as, in, in that similar way. And we kind of trace it to the idea that the Franciscans were kind of entering into uh, Mesoamerica, maybe because of what was happening with the Protestant Reformation. They were um, very uh, defensive, I suppose, and wanting to um, e explain the Catholic faith in terms they would have used in Europe. And of course, that wasn't matching with a pagan society. It had been so uh, many years since the Catholic Church had had to deal with su on, on such a level of philosophical depth with a pagan society. So there, there's just a mismatch in communication and so, understanding. So, so would you say in a way that the Franciscans went to a gunfight carrying a knife? That could be one way of possibly. It's like you brought it, you brought a knife to a gunfight kind of a situation. Well, like, in other we, words, we, they were vastly unprepared. Well, they, they, they seemed, our impression, when you read the dialogue mm -hmm. between the Franciscans and the Nawa, mm -hmm. it seemed as if the Franciscans, and, and it's understandable, it totally seems like understandable. they saw them as kind of simple polytheists. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they saw the brutality of the human sacrifice, and, and they, 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 were, they were in shock. Naturally. And they probably <laughs> could not believe that as the society that they were seeing could actually have so much depth to them that actually this transcendent belief kind of undergirded mm -hmm. a lot of what they were seeing, but the, it just was such a disconnect. Yeah. Like just to give you a quick example, the, the wars that were fought in order to get sacrificial victims, maybe people know about Tlaxcala or Huachoncinco or the places that they mm -hmm. pillaged a lot to get them. Those wars were called the flower wars. And the reason they were called the flower wars was because of this idea that sacrificial victims could, or warriors who, who, who shed blood could turn into butterflies and hummingbirds and go up mm -hmm. to the flower world paradise. It all, it underlined it, but, but mm -hmm. they, the missionaries couldn't see, it, it, would, it would have been impossible for anybody to know what was mm -hmm. going on underneath. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a total, yeah. what it is. They went, they went thinking that they'd have to do algebra, but they actually had to do trigonometry in a sense. Like, yeah. In a sense, that's yeah. a good way of putting it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah. So they were failing, as it were, as you say. They weren't doing so hot. And mm -hmm. what now all of a sudden, now if we go from failing to 9, 10 million people mm -hmm. in about 10 years, according to some historical records, what all right, that's big and huge. What is yeah. what what was the turnaround here? Okay. Glad you asked that. So there is so much going on that when you get to chapter two in our book, we kind of have to lay out a roadmap because mm -hmm. it's easy to get it's easy to get go lost. into the woods. So we narrow it down to four main points that we follow throughout the book. Okay. And I'll just briefly uh, mm -hmm. mention them. Number one are the transcendentals, which we've kind of touched upon. Second one is this idea of life after death or in a flower world paradise, that's number two. The third one is, is a concept of a one supreme God, especially of a one supreme God who makes you worthy to enter the flower world which paradise. Is a key point. And that's number four, worthiness, kind of everything that is encapsulated in the concept of worthiness. So the reason why this is important is because by the time the missionaries are there trying to the, convert the indigenous, but failing so miserably, what we had to do in the book is we had to show the missionary, the Christian Catholic version of these four points, mm -hmm. okay? That of course, the transcendental, the one, uh, uh, Jesus Christ is the logos, mm -hmm. he is the truth. I, I won't get too much into this, uh, but, there were, there were firmly implanted Christian concepts that the Franciscans were trying to give to the indigenous, but the indigenous had their own version. With their own descriptions. They had their, their own... own descriptions of the exact same thing. For example, number one, matching. the transcendental were the flowers that we've kind of already talked about. Number two, whereas the missions were missionaries were talking about a heavenly realm mm -hmm. that 
you could go to if you were baptized and the concept of original sin, the, the, the Nawa, the indigenous had a concept of a flower world paradise, okay, that, that you could only go to if Intlok and Nawakim made you worthy, the God of far and near. Yes. So by the time 1531, the morning of December 9th, mm -hmm. before Juan Diego goes on his trip to, to mass, these four concepts were firmly in place, but it just seemed impossible that there was a bridge could be made between those four concepts from a pagan one to a Christian one. It just seemed there was no, but, but, but we get a little bit dramatic in our book and we say, but with God, all things, things are, 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 are possible. And mm -hmm. he was just about to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So on the morning of December 9th begins this saga, mm -hmm. this narrative. And as you hear the narrative, every single point gets picked yes. off. Every, it, it, right off the bat, Juan Diego, as a baptized Christian, mm -hmm. walks into this place which sounds just like the flower world paradise, down to the same species of birds. And I the mean, same it, phrases, the, the same context, the same, the the same echoing structure. Off the mount, I mean, it's, it's, it seems like it's copied and pasted from these earlier song poems. So immediately a bridge of understanding is made between the, the, con the indigenous concept of a flower world paradise and the Christian idea of, a, of heaven. So, I mean, we could go on and on, but just to let you know, when Guadalupe introduces herself, she uses many different terms in the Nahuatl language. The third term she uses is, I am the mother of Intloque Nahuake, the god of far and near. The one in the earlier poems that says, the only one that can make one worthy to enter the flower world paradise. I mean, it's it's right there. And, it's, and that's just in the beginning of the Guadalupe that's narrative. The first 10 lines of uh, uh -huh. or, or 15, 14 lines, yeah. Of, of the story. So, so there's connections then between the Guadalupe narrative, which I would call it, if I may, and mm -hmm. what we found in the tradition through, through the Quicapacayot song poem. Yeah. There are parallels. There are and parallels. These parallels are are very apparent when you're familiar, with, especially with the with the with the Nahua language. Uh, but even in a, even in a basic English translation, you could probably start. Well, yeah, you could start. You know, playing connect the dots, right? Uh, yeah. Hence, why kids playing connect the dots or connect four when you're a kid is important, right? There you <laughs> it, go. It, it, it teaches you yeah, skills yeah. for adult life. See. Um, let, so let, me briefly, say, let me do one thing really quick, um, and 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 I, I wanted to double check right now. I was looking on. Um, on the Sophia site, and it does let you preview the uh, oh, table nice. of contents. So I want to show the audience that uh, <laughs> they got to get they got to get this book. It's loaded with tons of information. So I want to show people get the book. You've got yeah. tons of information here. I mean, Kevin is doing a fantastic job of getting to the meaty portions, and you all have been incredible. But I want to emphasize that there is a ton of material here. I mean, you all have really, really done your homework. And I want to emphasize to the audience, get the okay. book. In my opinion, what a perfect, perfect Christmas gift. Uh, just wanted to, sorry, briefly interrupt to say that, Kevin. No, 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 exactly. And like you can see the, uh, you know, the table of contents and just kind of got, wait, Olmec? What's, an, what's Olmec, you know? Uh, yeah. So it, it's uh, I mean, you guys can explain that better than I infinitely infinitely better than I ever could. But um, but yeah, so it, it's um, it, it's important. So we have these parallels, right? But now uh, I would be doing a, a huge disservice to uh, my certain of my theology professors from college, uh, like Dr. Andrew Minto and Dr. Stephen Hildebrand, who taught me the value of critical thinking, especially in theology. And Dr. Minto in particular, he taught biblical studies at Franciscan University. And um, he explained to us things like the historical critical methods and the historical critical methodology, the higher, the so-called higher criticisms that emanated mostly from, or a lot from, from, from German theology and German studies schools of thought. Um, so a difficulty that I see here is that somebody might go, eh, what about, you know, is, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, you guys admit that these poems existed for hundreds of years prior to the 16th century, and 
Now suddenly you, it looks like they you say Joseph, you said it yourself. They copy pasted, right? So I can hear uh, that objection. I can hear that. Sure. Yeah. So sure. there is, you know, forgive me for just putting something out to, out there, but like the, mm -hmm. the 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 Guadalupe narrative as we know it, the Guadalupe story is in a document called the Nika Mapoa, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was originally composed in the Nahuatl lang Nahua language, but is also available in uh, in in translation. Um, so, but it doesn't come until sometime after the events of 1531. Yeah. So yeah. between a, a copy paste job, but also however many, I think it was about a century or so later after the events in question, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as somebody who has studied, familiar with historical critical methodology, you know, there's some difficulties here, such as, you know, it could be copy pasted. Or how do we know that the Franciscans just didn't, you know, uh, ape the story, piggyback off the story and go, oh, wait a minute. Hey, you know, uh, and just kind of used it as a tool to sucker in the poor, innocent Nawa. You know, yeah. that's a narrative that somebody could say. Uh, what would you guys what do you guys think about that? And what would you what would your answer to that uh, objection be? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So just to set it up for Joseph really quickly, if we're going to take it a step back and take it from a historical perspective, mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, the Spanish, even as of 1570 and 1580, were making frequent comments on the complete incomprehensibility of the song poems, first and foremost. But if we backtrack even to um, 1531, when the Guadalupe event occurred, there was nine to 10 million conversions. And about how many years after this? This is about 28 years later, the Spanish finally took it upon themselves to collect the ancient song poems. So way, they didn't even become into a deeper knowledge of these song poems until 28 years later, which is when they so, captured it. So there's a question of the of the of the of chronology, time. Yeah, the words, chronology like, doesn't match up. It's yeah, it's it's hard to imagine some kind of a fakery you're saying mm -hmm. or fraud when the dates simply aren't matching up. Correct. I mean, okay. if you're looking at the whole knowledge of flower world and the culture and the philosophy are embedded in these song poems, and they're not even familiar with it until many years later, and then even 20 to 30 years after they get it, which is a a good 40 years after the Guadalupe event, even at that point, they were still saying they didn't understand it. And again, we're dealing with an issue of chronology with the philosophy and the culture and the language where they were just struggling with it from for years and years and years. It's only been the last 30 years that we started to understand it more deeply. So if Joseph well, came off that. Well, you know, this, the, I remember this came up when we were, when we were, <clears throat> when you, you know, Kevin and all of us were working on the book, uh, the whole idea of, Guadalupe, mm -hmm. anti-Guadalupe objections, there um, and there are so many. And and I and I know sometimes we have done other interviews, and sometimes Catholics are really shocked that there's this uh, whole body of work which is out there, books, articles, papers, everything, which are completely stating that Guadalupe is a fraud. Um, you know, was made up by some of the all these various theories about that. Um, I think that's what you're referring to. You seem to be pointing to like two criticisms. Number one's the, the, what, what Monique just addressed, um, but also the idea of the fact that the Guadalupe account wasn't written down until at least over a century later. Is that one of the, the issues that you seem to be bringing up? But it's one amongst many, many, many other objections. And I know that when we were talking and we were working on the book, uh, you felt like we had to address them. And yeah, it, it, it does make sense. What we finally ended up doing is we said, we have to bring up the one that we actually bring up in the book. And it's that one that you just said, did a Spanish use the Cuica Pecayo, the earlier song poems as source material for a fabricated Guadalupe narrative? Now, at the end of the book, we, we tackle that story and we bring mm -hmm. up the chronology mm -hmm. argument. But after you've gone through this whole journey of flower world and yes. the Olmecs and the Mayan and all this embedded culture, I we're hoping that you would get to the idea that you would just have to be some sort of a genius mm -hmm. uh, and, and be able to time travel or something mm -hmm. in order to have been able to lay everything out so it fits so perfectly together. 
Much in the same way the prophecies work in the Old Testament that all po point to Messiah. I mean, we're saying that perhaps a similar dynamic happened here in Mesoamerica, mm -hmm. but it was it was a way in which to show that the Mesoamerican people that God was trying, the Holy Spirit was trying to speak to them was super something supernatural was happening, making a case for you for belief. So, but I know I'm talking about a lot of different things at the same time, but um, we finally had to say we cannot go down every rabbit hole of all the anti Guadalupe objections, except for um, the one, except for that yeah. one, because it, it was central it was, to our premise. Yeah, you know, exactly. And that's so like, you know, and that's the wise choice. You can only handle what you can handle. And insofar yeah. as the focus of your book was X, if there was something that could have threatened the vital life of X, that's the one that you have to discuss. So you focus on what needs to be focused on, and that's wisdom. And yes. so I don't mean to like bring up any, you know, you know, naysaying about, about anything. Cause like when I when I when I read the book and you know during the editing process, like I, I have these, you know, theology running through my head, but it's precisely that point. It's the theology. And a lot of the historical critical method was rooted in enlightenment thinking. And even somebody as illustrious as Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, a.k.a. Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI, may he rest in peace, um, said that, you know, there's nothing wrong with those methods, but they have to be purged, as it were, of their enlightenment philosophy and the, 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 under, the underpinning there. And so when you do that, when you apply Ratzinger's principle here, I look at it from the theological perspective and I go, all right. Grace builds upon nature. I look at the history, and Monique, you point out that you know that there's anachronisms there that doesn't make things aren't made, adding up. You know, the Franciscans, out of the bishop's own hand, were struggling with everything, and then suddenly, only within ten years, you got all these millions of people. But mm -hmm. they only started collecting the song poems twenty eight years after the Gua after Guadalupe, mm -hmm. so the time frame isn't adding up. So mm -hmm. you look at the data objectively uh, on the human level. Okay, okay, fine. But then when you cross over the realm of the divine science, that is theology, the queen of the sciences, well, grace builds upon nature and God will work with things. And this is what I, I appreciate about the book as you address this head on with that part about the, 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 the gospel preparation. You know, yes. um, God uses all of this history and they're struggling. And all of a sudden, and I think when we were editing and talking in our private Zoom chats, going over everything, I said, so basically, are you guys saying that this is Our Lady's hold my beer moment? You know, where she was yeah. like, like yeah. everybody's failing. She's like, all right, fine, hold my beer. Boom. Mama comes and takes care of business, right? You know, yes. yeah. so that's kind of what I was seeing here. And it mm -hmm. all makes, it all kind of comes together. Mm -hmm. Um but like, it's not just like, it's not, you can't look at the, it's not just the historical critical methodology and the, the historical criticisms, you know, like some of these criticisms are, I mean, like, I don't know if you guys had heard or not, but uh, just real quick, um, there's a three volume series coming out by Dr. Philip Blosser and Charles Sullivan on speaking in tongues. And they have hmm. been doing some very groundbreaking work and they basically start criticizing a little bit a little bit the historical critical methodology and that that, that German higher criticism and I think that as it's applied to the phenomenon of of, um, of xenolalia versus glossolalia long story short but um it may, so like foreign tongues like you know I, I don't speak Spanish very well but it's a human language versus that that's called glossolalia as opposed to xenolalia that's a distinction that they make in the book but it, it they remind us. But the point I want to make is the point is that they they remind us that the historical critical methods of German higher criticism, they're not the end all be all, and mm -hmm. I think that's important to point out here is that they are tools that are meant to be taken for purged from their enlightenment uh, 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 philosophy, but they're a tool that's meant to be taken in conjunction with other things. And yes. that includes theology itself, theology proper. And yes. I love the way you guys lay it out because you show the human. And this is that principle we talked about earlier. You show the human in this as mucky, as muddy, as, a, as murky as all of it can be. You dig out that history throughout Mesoamerica and then you 
line it up with the Guadalupe story as told in the Nicoma Poa, and as we as we understand it, with the, and you, you're honest, you say these are the sources, you know. Um, again, going back to the footnote <laughs> discussion, right? But you show the sources and you walk people through all of this. And when you're reading this, you're like, oh, even just you know when we were talking about it in our edit in our meetings and stuff, it's like, oh my goodness, like this is just absolutely totally groundbreaking because it explains so much. You know, a lot of people want to attribute this divine, miraculous, just the grace just fell from heaven. And, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. It's much more simple, but yet also profound at the same time. And that's the mark of the <laughs> divine. And you can't fake that. It, you can't right. fake that. And that's where I look at that from a theological perspective with in reason and say, you can't fake it. So while there may be some valid points that one could make, that the, some of those criticisms, as I've seen it and read about it, uh, with, as it applies to the Guada, to Guadalupe, it just it doesn't explain all of the data. Um, no, mm -hmm. you can just maybe offer a couple of things to enlighten us, and we would, we would just expand a little bit more on that. Well, okay, we I remember we were debating of chapter two. Mm -hmm. Chapter two is called "Preparing the Way," and it's referring to a term that Eusebius coined called preparatio evangelica, evangelical preparation, which is Christian doctrine. It, it's essentially the idea that a pagan culture can be prepared mm -hmm. to receive the gospel message in the fullness of time. That's essentially the concept. And there's different ways that God does that. And it has happened all over the world. However, in our research, it hasn't been applied to... The That's Americas, so as, as, yeah. as, as much as we, I mean, there's a few kind of incidences, the Blue Lady of Texas or, or different kind of stories that you've heard, but not in the way that it's been applied to China, Korea, Middle Persia. East, the Hebrews, mm -hmm. so many different, uh, different cultures. So the thing is, is that we really had to make the case that God does not spring things on cultures. He, he, like a good father, he prepares yeah. people, he mm -hmm. enlightens people, he gives clues, he leaves breadcrumbs, he does different things in order to gently lead his children to mm -hmm. himself. He did it all around the world. Why did he not do it in the Americas? So, so yeah, so is it a, in a way, it, could you say that what all, everything that you're describing, or well, that you do in more depth, of course, in, course in the book, it's almost like Mesoamerica's Old Testament leading up to the New Testament. We often use mm -hmm. that as an example that we believe that this or, is or like, like a part one and a part, part two. two. The Guadalupe story is part two of a, of a long meta narrative, mm -hmm. a three thousand year story, a, a God salvific plan for the Americas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the way that we have been explaining it. But it, it God uses in order similar. to help the, the 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 you know the mesoamericans to understand the message of the gospel right like that's like the purpose of all of it it's like it's like mm -hmm. and so like but like how then does our can you just say a quick maybe just briefly about how does our lady do it that she ties this all in and uh everybody just like starts to like everybody all these millions of people come in like could you just say something briefly about that well, we bring up in that second chapter the concept of prophecy. Uh, most people think that prophecy is uh, uh, when you predict something, but in the in the greater Catholic concept, it's essentially concepts that are laid down that could be through prefigurement, metaphor, symbology, even through true myth. We haven't even gotten into that kind of J.R. Tolkien concept of true myth, but mm -hmm. that a foundation can be laid that can later be fulfilled Mm -hmm. at at a given time mm -hmm. and another that's another point that we that we try to show in our book is that the timing was perfect that these not these pagan concepts kind of reached an apex a fullness right before the conquest occurred and it was ready and, and the people were ripe to be uh to be converted when guadalupe as always the one who carries the, the, the theotokos the one that carries the message the one that carries the logos, that she was doing the same thing as she has done in, in other places. And, and of course, by, by uh, the, the, you know, with Jesus, the mother of God. So what happens is, is, is that um, it, it's fulfilling 
prophecy. It's fulfilling evangelical preparation. It's fulfilling true myth. It's fulfilling so many different things. But Guadalupe was the, the conduit. She was the vessel once again, as she's always been. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the, the more specific things that I found very fascinating is like you, you guys just brought like the larger picture, but also like when Our Lady speaks, you know, when she says, when she identifies herself explicitly as the mother of the God of near and far, you know, mm -hmm. that that's just one way, but that, 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 that there's all these tie-ins, but mm -hmm. now just, we, we touched upon it briefly and put a pin on it. I want to go back to it really quick is that Mesoamericans were all over the place. Guadalupe at a very singular location. And mm -hmm. this is one of the things I love about when you guys, you're having this focus of the book is that you're not putting as much on the tilma because the tilma was always in that general area. Mm -hmm. of, uh, it, 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 I believe it's in Mexico City now, to, in the cathedral there, correct? Is that, do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Tepeyac. Tepeyac, yeah. mm -hmm. Tepeyac. But ev these conversions were all over, you know, at, at, like much farther away. They weren't doing pilgrimages to, to the tilma and also they see it convert. You know, it has to do with the knowledge of the culture. And they're hearing the story through the oral culture, which is what they were, a lot more larger oral-based culture in, in, in Mesoamerica. So word of mouth is spreading, and mm -hmm. now everybody believes that, or that they're seeing this, and they, they may some of them may go, but also some may have heard it. The missionaries are going out. Um, and But what's the connection then between all of that and baptism? And seeking baptism and uh, and the specific aspects of the story. Was there any one singular one in particular? Well, there's quite a f most of the accounts. There's there's quite a few of them that are located in a one particular source, and ma majority of those accounts point to conversions and asking for baptism hundreds of miles away from Tepeyac. I think that's what you're referring to. So you'll see the different monasteries, about seven different monasteries. They're all about 60 to 70 miles apart. Only one of them is close to Tepeyac. The rest are south, sometimes 70, 140 to 210 miles away. And for instance, in one account that's located about 300, well, in one account, the monastery is about 210 miles away. And what happened on this particular date is approximately... 12 different tribes came from uh, some of them as far as 200 miles away to that one location asking for baptism, um, speaking, asking, many, different speaking many different languages. And the Spanish, of course, had no idea how they even heard about them, let alone to know to ask for baptism. And part of what the book is about is kind of the substance of the flower world being so pervasive that when Guadalupe came and I identified herself directly with their narrative, with their language, with their metaphors, that that's what in a sense caused this incredible change of heart to occur. You want and, to and, and just to, just to back that up, there's so many um, kind of historical anomalies that, historians have had pro problems with the mm -hmm. Guadalupe story. Mm -hmm. um, we won't go into all of them, but one of the big ones is that how could, how could it possibly be nine to 10 million conversions mm -hmm. when there were probably at the height, maybe 22 million people in that area in Mexico at the time of the Spanish arrival. And many I mean, that's, died. A, that's such a high percentage. That was before the plagues. That mm -hmm. was before, for the wars. So the, mm -hmm. the, the population had gone down quite a bit by the time, you know, of 1531. So many historians just write it off. They just say, it's this impossible. is just impossible. But what we're trying to say is, and, and, and actually the anthropologists make the point for us, mm -hmm. flower world was huge. In fact, they don't even just use the term Mesoamerica. They use the term pan Mesoamerica because not only does it include central Mexico going all the way to El Salvador, it also includes areas of the American Southwest. Mm -hmm. Now we're not claiming that people, you know, indigenous right. from Arizona made it all the way down to Mexico City. We're not making that claim, but right. we're saying that if you're going to be able to come up with that number, it has to have, it had to have been over a wide geographical area 
And as I said, the anthropologists make that claim for us. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the Guadalupe story going out mm -hmm. from Tepeyac, that's part of the tradition, like we already talked about. Major historical events, especially of a philosophical nature, would have been turned into one single song that would have gone from village to village, village. And memorized, it would have duplicated like a like a computer meme, okay? Which was possible in that culture because they were trained in intense memorization skills, right? Which we didn't bring up, right? So the Guadalupe narrative, more than likely, was itself turned into a flower song. Would have been memorized by these singers and could have gone out thousands of miles away from Tepeyac. So, um, uh, you know, so so that so that's one way to be able to to talk about the amount of conversions that occurred. Um, but of course, you run into some other issues because um, people would say, well, the, the 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 narrative now is that it would have been the tilma that converted everybody, and we're not saying in any way that the tilma is not important. It's extremely it's important. extremely important, and it's completely of a miraculous nature and actually i would say the 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 site of a, of having a pilgrimage of actually having a pilgrimage site a locus a focus was really what brought mexico together it had to have a pinpoint area because right from the very beginning you hear about spanish ladies and indigenous people coming to together Tepeyac together and and having their uh, petitions fulfilled from very 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 early on so um the, the pilgrimage site was extremely important, but so was the story. So were the mural paintings. So was the four-petaled flower. We're saying that this was all part of a larger network mm -hmm. of, uh, that was all meant to convert the Americas. And there were so many other means on top of the tilma, as we're saying, the tilma is the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when they're they're seeking baptism and everything, and like if they're making if the if the Nahuatl or Mesoamericans in general were making these connections, would you say that there's a connection between viewing baptism and that fourth uh, pillar of the worthiness to enter heaven and the flower world paradise? Is there a connection there? Absolutely, because what what we what we believe happened, okay, is. Uh, we, we haven't even gotten into myth and the hero story and things like that. But essentially, the, the narrative of Guadalupe could be read on many different levels. On perhaps a very simple uh, level would be, did the hero find the flowers? Find the flowers? In did, reality. Did he complete his quest? And if he completes the quest... What does he get in return for that? Just on a very, it's, it's way deeper than that. I, I remember we were having a debate about that or when we were going over the editing. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Kevin that was with your, our foil. He helped us refine our understanding yeah, that of was, our that own was material. Your job. Actually, he, that's why you were yeah. recommended. Because we, uh, we knew he played the devil's advocate and push us yeah, really hard to be us. very specific and <laughs> what we're what we're saying, what the message we're trying to convey. So thank you, Kevin, for thank doing you, that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I had, and I had to demur push us. You pushed us. And I had to demur a little bit on that because I'm like, you guys are the ones who know the languages better than I do. I'm just looking at what you're putting out there. And I was just like, well, like because I remember the specific matter was with the singer in the Quica Pacayo. I was like, mm -hmm. "Well, is he meant to be taken literally when he says when he starts doubting if he was ever really there, you know, or like because the question was was he really there or not?" And I was mm -hmm. kind of like, "Well, I could I could read him in the sense of you know he was there, but like it, it's like it's like that the seeing through the glass dark, the mirror darkly or the glass darkly, like Saint Paul says, mm -hmm. you know, we never quite get there in this life because there's that veil between us, you know." And that's kind yeah. of how I was yeah. reading the Quica Pacayo, but you guys were taking this a little bit differently. And it was like, from that, we went that back and forth, you know, the argument was refined, you know, um, but I got it. And it had, and it had, well, it had to do with that exact point mm -hmm. was, was, do we read the poem in one way? Do, would there be different audiences? How, like, like the way you read any poem, you know, you, you, you may read it through the first time you get something out of it you read it for the 10th time and you get much more out of it. The things that you didn't get from the first time, that's that's what poetry does. So hearing the Guadalupe narrative on, on one account, if you knew the earlier story, you might say, 
Juan Diego found the flowers. Now, what do the flowers mean? The flowers mean the truth of the universe. So, so, so Juan Diego found the truth. He found it through Christianity, and it was the God of far, far and near, Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice, expiates sin and allows people, if they want to take that cross, they could they could go to the flower of paradise mm -hmm. or they could go to heaven. So these dots were connected. And we were uh, perhaps on a simple level, you know, which we, we talk about in our book, mm -hmm. but obviously Mesoamerica, as we've been explaining, has a very, very deep philosophical tradition. And it was, it was particularly espoused by men called the Tlamatineme. Those were the wise men. Those were the philosophers. Those were the ones who wrote the flower song poems. And they were the keepers of the traditions. Yes. They were the keepers of the traditions. They would have had to have understood the deeper philosophical underpinnings of mm -hmm. what had happened with Juan Diego, a real commoner, a real person from Cuatitlan that was actually from a real place. So when they would be, the reason they had to have accepted it because that was the only way a flower song poem could have been produced about Guadalupe. So there was already kind of like a checks and balances. There was already this yeah. ongoing system of how religious ideas or philosophical ideas were vetted. So it would have had to have gone that process. But once the Tlamatineme, once the Nahua philosophers would have said, wait a minute, we're seeing these connections. Mm -hmm. Juan Diego found the flowers. He found the truth. And we, what made him capable of finding the truth was? His Christian baptism. baptism. That would have been the key. That oh. would have been the, the way that would have opened the door to e eternity. So that so with, within those checks and balances, the flower song would have been created. It would have gone out. It would have been performed and sung yes. in village to village. And that's Dance important to. because, you know, I'm a composer of musicians. Music is meant to give it an emotional impact. It's it's meant to touch your heart. That's what's mm -hmm. that's what you know. We Gregorian chant well, and, and well, are, there, are there any traces of that in the of what of this background that you're saying in the in the in the the Nika Mapoa, the document that contains the Guadalupe the Guadalupe story? No, not in the account itself. But but there are historical accounts talking about the tradition of hearing the Guadalupean song poem sung. Specifically, okay, see, there, there's there's four accounts of, of the Guadalupe story. There was one in 1648 by Miguel Sanchez, Father Miguel Sanchez. That's written in Spanish. 1649, Luis Lasso de la Vega. That's the one in Nahuatl. That's the one we're, that we're talking about. That's This one has really become the definitive version, uh, translating Spanish and English. But the, And there's a complex story behind that. But yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, 1666, Luis Becerra Tanco. He, uh, that's another one, 1688, um, Father... Guess, Florencia. Florencia. Okay, those are, those are all three in Spanish. The only one is the 1649 version. 1666 version, Luis Becerra Tanco actually I, gives an eyewitness account of when he was young, seeing the Guadalupe Flower World song performed. He, he describes mm -hmm. it. He said mm -hmm. he sees two old men mm -hmm. in the middle with a, a drum. one drum called a wewet, which is a standing log drum. The other one is a horizontal drum called a teponatsli. He says yeah. he sees the two drums being played. And dancers. That, and there's dancers all around the singers, the, the two singers in the middle, and they're singing. The Guadalupe the, narrative. The Guadalupe narrative. And what year was this that he wrote about this? 1666. Okay, so. so, so but he said it happened in his youth. And he was yeah. in the seventies when that happened. So, okay, so so he's he's describing events that predated all of these documents that you just mentioned. These four documents. Yes. I, on top of which, I, I wanted to say something really quickly about the sixteen forty nine because I know you're historically breaking it down, Kevin. That sixteen forty nine version actually echoes word for word an earlier mm. document that was written in fifteen fifty six that didn't come to light till much much later. So the fact that you have a written, handwritten copy in 1556 and then a printing press copy in 1649 that the whole world knows about, and it matches it exactly like the first section of it, word for word. 
phrase for phrase. So it, it was based on an older tradition, basically, this later document that came out in 1649. And that so, earlier document, by the way, the 1556 version is in the New York Public Library mm -hmm. in a, in a wow. collection called the Lennox yeah, Collection. Yeah, the Lennox the Guadalupano, Collection. Uh, Monumentos Guadalupanos, mm -hmm. that's the name of the collection. And the main reason yeah, that has its own story to this. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important point because, you know, like, like I'm a writer and I know when I'm collecting documents or if I'm doing oral histories on stuff and you're putting things all together, you know, there's a difference. Things that are that were messy and all over the place before, shall we say, when you organize them mm -hmm. into a one document, you know, people tend to kind of go by what was organized, forgetting that there was a lot of that earlier stuff, because what's the need for all of that? Right. When, when you've got this nice, neat, put together, you know, spoon fed sort of a thing. But no, you can't, you have to have one without, you can't have one without the other. You have to know what came before in order to understand this, you know, that what's in this document. So like in theology, we talk about the famous Q source, you know, for like Mark's gospel mm -hmm. is the shortest. So it's probably the earliest. And he was basing himself upon maybe some written document that we, they call the Q source. Um, and, uh, but there's no actual piece of paper that proves this, you know, it's a hypothesis. But the idea that I want to, that I'm bringing out is, is that we, there, you can criticize things, you can point certain things out, but you have to factor in the human, you know, and as a writer, I, I see this. And that's one of the things that also strikes me with your book is, is that, it, like I said, it's just how human it all is, but speaking towards these larger events while being fair and critical to people at the same time, you know, firm, firm, but fair. Um, you know, it, it's, so we see these documents pop up in the 17th century, you know, the 1600s, but they, it's not, that not, that doesn't come out of a vacuum. There's right. a system, And that's the yeah. point that needs to be uh, uh, highlighted here. And mm -hmm. we have this great historical reference from the 1550s, Monique, that you mentioned, that it's proof that, Things are not being made up. There's an earlier tradition, you know. Correct. But we have to factor in the, that it's an oral, largely an oral culture. So not everything is going to be written, and it, so it's not going to be nice and neat and tied up in a little bow like a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. crit critical scholars would like it to be. I, again, things get messy, and you have to factor all of it in. Um, mm -hmm. well, I think that's important to remember. But I think that's a great point that you bring out about there is an existing tradition beforehand. And specifically, we have we do have something from that, uh, some documentation that lines up perfectly with what happens a hundred years later. You know, right? Uh, right. Nothing. And it, 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 does show, it does show a pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we what we were trying to do. You know, as we kind of explained in our introduction, we were looking at the information and going down all these different rabbit holes, <laughs> and it took us years to get through it, but. Honestly, we just wanted to get down to the bottom of it. Yes. And, and actually, we, we, we were on the presumption for many of the first years, thinking that it might be a fabrication. Uh, we, and we, we were willing to entertain we, that. We were willing to go there if, if that's what it pointed to. And we but, had some scary moments, mm -hmm. um, you know, when we would read a book where yes. we would walk away and whoa, oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> this is all made up. This, this is totally fabricated. And if that's true, what does that mean? Right. And, and some of these scholars were, were very convincing and someone got really snarky at times and really mm -hmm. kind of criticized if, if, if you had any sort of faith uh, at all, mm -hmm. but we, we kept plowing through and we had to kind of go over this, hump of knowledge a big hump a big hump of knowledge where we finally were, had to be able to look back at the book that at one time we thought was completely true and then we found that there's three books written that were criticizing this book mm -hmm. and breaking down their method that they were using and saying that it was completely false and we're like whoa you know if we didn't stick with this we would have we just believed we would have just believed it and, and yeah. moved on so it's it, it kind of like, I think goes back to what I think it's in scripture, if I remember correctly. Something, uh, what's that? What's is it in Proverbs, William? You, I think you know this stuff better than I do, but it was something like, uh, a man sounds convincing until Proverbs. you see the other side. Yep, 
Yeah, the book of yeah. Proverbs. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. That, yeah that's, we went through that. We went through that uh, many times. And, you know, we were we were saying before that we needed to stay away from some of these arg the anti-Guadalupe arguments. Mm -hmm. We did that in the book, but we. But, but now we, we can tackle it. We went into, verbally. <laughs> yeah, I actually uh, thought that we were going to tackle that. I wrote eighty-five pages on Guadalupe apologetics. apologetics. So we kind of already have to start our second book, perhaps, yeah, where we actually we do. do break down those argue, those anti-Guadalupe arguments. But that's another story. But the only reason I'm bringing it up is because we felt we had to be honest yes. and to tackle these objections if we could move forward. And finally, after so many years, we, we just got a glimpse of the entire uh, picture. And actually, you know, somebody brought this up in another interview, but and, and I, I didn't think about this till later, so I'll tell you right now. The question was, when was the big aha moment? When did you actually kind of see the big picture? And I remember now, it was about a week or so that I went to a Mesoamerican conference, which was in LA at the Getty Museum. They were presenting this new document called the Florentine Codex. I won't get into it, but it's a major document from that time period, early Spanish colonial period. Mm -hmm. That's another tangent. But a lot of these scholars that we were studying were there and were actually speakers. And one and of the... Yeah, you could talk to them face to face. You could, and, you could and actually kind of talk them. to them. You could have lunch with them. You could do this. And, and I did that. And one of the major speakers, the fellows of this giant grant that the Getty Museum was putting out, giant grant. I had lunch with them. And it, and it was so great being there because everybody knew the documents. I mean, you didn't have to like say, you know, you know, the yeah. Nika like And it, a lot of them under, they, speak Nahuatl. They actually speak fluent classical Nahuatl, they do. which is mind-blowing. I mean, they're totally into this Excellent. world. So I, I was sitting there and I said, you know, the Cuica Picayo, and he's like, yeah, the origin of the songs. And I said, yeah. I said, uh, and then you know the Nika Mopoa. And, and he said, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he goes, yeah. I go, have you ever seen the fur, the Quica Pacao being part one and the Nika Mopoa being part two? And I, and I just I like his eyes just lit up mm -hmm. and he said, you know, I could see what you're saying. And he said, you got to write a You got to write a paper on this. You got to write a dissertation on this and you have to present it next time because that is mind blowing. He goes, mm -hmm. you are really onto something. I have never thought of it that way. And of course, that we talk about that in the book because, you know, the, the narrative flows so easily from one story to the next. But I remember after hearing him say that, and I think this mm -hmm. was in 2017 or 2017, so, 2017, yeah. I thought, okay, if this guy here, if he's convinced, if he's convinced and thinks we're onto something, then maybe we should do, then we really book. do need to write a book on this. Yeah. And there you have it, you know, and, and then like three years wow. after you guys met with him, um, you know, that's when I got involved because um, it was Father Murr who, had, who uh, we, he's a mutual acquaintance of ours and Father Charles Murr, that is. And um, he was like, Kevin, you've got to take a look at this. And I was like, well, what's going on? And he said, there's a couple out there, Kevin. I recommended you to them because you know this stuff with prior revelation, theology, and all this stuff, and they really could use your help. They've got this awesome thesis. I sat and listened to them for like a couple hours at my, at, I, I can't remember if he said it. Four days. It was four days. Four days. Actually. Four days, yeah. <laughs> he sat and listened to either your, his house or your house. And he's like, Kevin, I was just absolutely blown away. He said, they tie together so many things. So I was like, well, okay, all right, you know, give them my phone number, email, whatever. And, um, and that was the rest was history. We talked on the phone. You sent me stuff on Google Drive, and I'm looking it over, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I can see the potential here. It was definitely in its nascent stages, and I was like, this needs a lot of help. No offense. <laughs> Love you guys, <laughs> but that I'm like, this needs a lot of help. <laughs> it was in bad shape at first. We admit it. <laughs> well, we didn't. We didn't have a centralizing theme at the at that time, but you. Uh, it started at a thousand pages, and we got it down to like three forty or something like that. Wow. That yeah, a yeah. thousand. Wow. But you had yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And there was multiple yeah. versions of it. It wasn't just that one. So yeah, and you had so, yeah. we, we needed help with structure. But yeah, um, it, yeah, yeah. And you had you had the general outline, and actually the outline was actually was pretty good. Um, but I think the person that provided more of the structure was the other editor at the time, Eric. Uh, yeah. He's actually agreed, I think, in English, or he has more formal education in that area even than I do. And, um, you know, Eric 
you know, I remember in our meetings and stuff, he was just very like, no, this, you know, he was just, he wasn't, wasn't rigid at all. I wouldn't say that, but he was like, you know, I recommend this for part of the structure. We had debates and open discussions about, you know, between all four of us every so often. I think it was just more of the four sister, sister uh, Lucy was more about, you know, the, the editing and stuff, but with the graphics. Um, but between the four of us, you know, we really kind of had to hammer out certain uh, ideas yes. to give them yeah. form and structure. Yeah. But I think it worked yeah. out in the end, from as best as I can yeah. tell. You know, like, yeah. by the time I saw that, by, by the time I, you know, my work ended on the editing, you know, a whole year had passed and you guys had gone on uh, with Sophia and stuff. And, you know, um, so I can only really speak up to about June, August of last year. But, you know, I, I we have to, I think I have to be honest and give credit, you know, to Eric for really bringing a lot more of that superstructure and going through a lot of those initial edits and, Mm -hmm. You know, the hours long conversations I would have with him on the phone, Eric, what about this? <laughs> <laughs> the poor guy, I yeah. think I, I, I blew up his phone. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, if I were to look back during that time period, it, and it, it was really a special time. I, I really was. enjoyed the camaraderie and the conversations. Um, you know, what we, we did, we, I, yeah, I know, we, had, we had weekly Zoom meetings scheduled. Mm -hmm. We would it all would come go on. Two to three hours. <laughs> well, it would go sometimes on for several hours. Wow. Uh, everybody, uh, Eric was more about structure. And philo philosophical side And things. he was really good at kind of bunching concepts together. Really good at that. And, uh, you know, at one time, chapters, just the analysis of the Nika Mopo, I think it was <laughs> 90 pages. Yeah, it uh, was. And he... he Put it down to about twenty, so that we was, couldn't include everything. Yeah, yeah, and and we, you know, as the authors, and we had been living with it for so long, mm -hmm. you get so myopic. You know, yes. you you can't see the way that a, an gonna outside hit. reader is going to hit. You you just you're totally uh, you, you lose all objectivity. And when you came in, when uh, and Eric yeah. and Eric Eric was providing structure. He was giving theological arguments, but your role, Kevin, was a critical eye to be able to say to try to blow holes in to what we blow were saying. holes in what we were saying to really challenge us to make the point mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to prove what we needed to prove to rethink uh, many of the assumptions that we had perhaps come with over mm -hmm. the years to reevaluate them to dig a little bit deeper mm -hmm. to be able to do a little bit more research perhaps in order to be able to explain what we're trying to explain and speak more clearly I, right yeah. i specifically remember that I, at some points i was just like what's going on like what, what's your site what's your sourcing what's your citation you know and i'm like mm -hmm. i got a, i was able to apply my bostonian efficiency and it's like no you can really condense this you have like all these things if you put it this way Mm -hmm. it, it covers everything, you know, it just make it much more efficient. That was actually one of the things that Father Murray told me about. He's like, Kevin, that's like exactly what I was hoping you'd be able to do. <laughs> that, yeah, that's yeah. why he recommended, he that's why yeah, he recommended you. And, you know, of course, as we said, we, we, we got it from around a 900,000 page document to about three something. 340, I think. And then by the time we got to, we did about three other versions where we, mm -hmm. we restructured it. We did. Uh, well, two before we got it to Sophia, and then we we got our uh, our editor, editor Laura Bement, and she did a, a ton of work. She did a fantastic Oof. job, and she must have cut out at least thirty, forty thousand <laughs> words. Out. Easy, easy. Uh, and she really streamlined things, and um, she did a fantastic job too. So our entire team yeah. was really incredible. Of course, our our illustrator mm -hmm. Lucia. Spera, so yeah, and all for the whole purpose of kind of conveying this idea that in the same way that God prepared people on the other side of the Atlantic, he did just as much work on this side of the Atlantic to prepare people because he again, going back to the fact that he cares, you know, he cares about the details and he he plants yeah. things throughout the years in the details. So he fulfills it in a similar manner. And that always kind of geeks us out and makes us really happy that, you know, especially with the times as they are right now, it could be easy to despair because of the chaos, the lack of order, all the scandals. But it always it does always come back to Jesus and Mary. And it is a simple message, but it's a profound message. 
that God is even preparing us, we can entertain that idea in today's times and refining and purifying us for heaven. And that if it, that's, all, that's the whole purpose of the journey. And that's what Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy is all about. You know, we're God all, is in control. God of is history. in control of history. He's preparing us now the same way he prepared people then. And um, we can lean on that. We can lean on that. William, I can't close any better than that. <laughs> I agree. I agree. You all, you all were I phenomenal. can't top that one. I'm, uh, it's almost nine o'clock my time. I can't top that one. Yeah, oh. we, we, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll wrap it up right there. But, but I want to tell you all, y'all were phenomenal. Phenomenal. You were incredible. You were great. I mean, what a flawless presentation. Uh, again, there's a link down there. By the time this airs, the link will be there. Mm -hmm. Um, God bless you all. Y'all were great. But before we wrap it up, before we wrap it up, I, I'd like to give Kevin a moment to put a plug in for anything he may be working on. I'd like to give you two yeah, the Kevin. final word. I'd like to give you two the final word or put in any other plug you'd like to. But Kevin, brother, uh, put in a plug. People know you as the man when it comes to Fatima. Anything else you want to plug, brother? A webpage, anything? Well, I, um, my webs I haven't touched much of my website. I've been I work two jobs now, uh, just bring a little extra money, you know. Uh, you know, inflation's killing us all. But um mm -hmm. I, I do I still continue some work. My website is kevinsimmons.com, K-E-V-I-N-S-Y-M-O-N-D-S.com. Uh I work two jobs as I said, but uh, I do try to get other projects done. And actually I'm working on some uh a Bella Dodd project right now. Um, Fun. I'm going to be, I'm creating an anthology of her known le recorded lectures. They're being transcribed. I'm annotating them and I'm hoping to publish them all in book form. Uh, that's like one of my big projects right now. So I get that's exclusive. I'm, I can publicly announce this now uh, on, on the show. So that's exclusive to your show, William. Um, and I just, I'm happy to say, I just discovered the fifth, a fifth uh, forgotten lecture that was recorded. And I just got it earlier this week, so it's we're all busy we're working with that now. And I've created a master list of uh, of her known published art, uh, articles about her that are available, and still adding that list. Almost fifty, it's like fifty pages long. It's 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 insane. Um, so yeah, some good stuff coming down the pipeline with that. Uh, the second edition of the Fatima book is presently in the hands of my diocese uh, with the Sensory Borum for the for official church approval with the Imprimatur. I'm hoping to hear back from that uh, very soon. But next year that'll come out. Uh, we're hoping anyway. Um, maybe up some updates to that. Um, yeah. So that's. I mean, that's nothing. Multiple's going on over this end. So. And we will definitely have you back on again, without a doubt, Kevin. We will. And uh, Joseph and Monique, you all have been incredible for sure. You all will definitely Thank be back you, again. Man. Yeah, you were great. You will definitely have you back again. But I'd like to give you two. So a moment, do you want to plug in anything else, a web page, anything else, or talk about a future, maybe another book in the future, anything? The floor is yours right now. Anything you want to plug? Well, we did start a website uh, to give additional information for the book. It's Guadalupe Flower World Prophecy.com. Guadalupe Flower World Prophecy. It's under construction, but we're really hoping to give a lot of the information. That's it, actually in the book because we, we really, yeah, we want to get the word out. Uh, there, there are videos that support our hypothesis. There's so many, there's so much material resources. out there and resources, even many of uh, links to the doctoral papers that we cite. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's actually a lot that is just quickly a, a priest in Mexico city oh, that's right. is on the same wavelength. Uh, he just published a doctoral dissertation talking about the earlier song poem and the Nicomopola. So uh, we haven't met him. We just discovered it a few mm -hmm. weeks ago. So we want to put that information on there. So Guadalupe Flower World Prophecy .com. We are um, having it translated into Spanish. Yes. Uh, we could use some financial help with that. It's it's a lot more expensive than we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, we don't know how to do that. Uh, maybe you could people could email us through the website or something if they'd like to help so. yeah and i can confirm that what they are saying is true uh because even though i may know spanish fluently i'm not a professional uh editor or uh you know i need admitted help so i can tell you that it can get quite pricey quite expensive so head on over there 
give them any kind of support. And I know one of the best ways you can support them, get a hold of the brand new book, get a yeah. copy, mm -hmm. give a, a ton of them, give gifts out. This is a great, Aww. great gift during this incredible time right now. Uh, you all have been incredible. And the best way you can help any of us, pray for all of us. Yes. Pray for all pray. of us. Yeah. Pray for all of us. And, and, you know, I had a great time with you all this evening. I look forward to being back with all of you all in the future. God bless you. Have a great evening. Thank you, God William. Bless God bless you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you.